You're listening to the Racer Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out race92.com for all your racing merchandise needs, just like this great Roberto Guerrero shirt that I have on. I'm your co host, Aaron Mack, the other co host. You may have seen him walking out of a great club with a big old smile on his face. You may have seen him in a dirt track. He's the one and only Scott Bowie. Hello, Aaron. Hello, Scott. How are you? I'm doing good, bud. How are you? I'm good. Speaking of Roberto Guerrero, I was actually just texting with him about um I just sent him I just sent his grandkids some shirts. So um yeah, hopefully they enjoy him. I know they just got him like I think yesterday. But um, oh, that's, that's cool, somebody man. we we need to try to get back on the show at some point. And I know he'll do it. So maybe sometime this winter. Yeah, or... that was that was really good. It was a lot of fun too. Absolutely. Great guy. Absolutely love Roberto. Like you said, one of the nicest guys in racing. Oh yeah. Hands down. I um, mean, speaking of nice guys in racing, we have one on today for our show. Yep, Mimo Gidley. Yep, great guy. And for those who don't know really a lot about Mimo. Um, he drove in champ car for a while you know he had some good finishes he drove for ganassi i think it was just one year um but you know he drove for you know the targets of ganassi car and um you know really great driver then after that he um you know i know he had some bad accidents along the way but he also drove in grand am series and you know had a pretty good career in grand am drove for the playboy racing team which we talk about and he um he really enjoyed that experience which <laughs> I could probably understand why. Um, and now he's actually racing, and I do apologize, I don't remember the name of the series, but it's the series that replaced like the Pirelli World Challenge. And he's been winning some races, so definitely great to see him back in the winner circle where he belongs. Um, and, you know, like I said before, you know, really great guy. And he's definitely someone I would like to get back on as well, again, at some point. <clears throat> yeah, you know, he was, uh, you know, here again, man, it's, People think, oh, Mimo Gidley, he's this foreign driver with all this money, which neither were even close to the yeah. truth. And uh, he tells a story about how he comes back uh, with all of his possessions. And uh, he really uh, he really was uh, uh, really a blue-collar guy in a lot of ways. And, and uh, that's what got him through. And uh, just... Uh, it was a good talk, you know. I, I didn't know a ton about Mimo. I, I knew what I saw, but I didn't know his backstory. And uh, great guy, man. Real inspiration. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he talks about a couple years ago when he got a really bad wreck at Daytona to where he would go to the dock to look at his boat, and he couldn't even really hardly get out of the car. Um, and he's definitely come a long way since then. I mean, he's racing out, and he's winning races. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't get any better than that. No, it doesn't. Um, yeah, you know, racing gives and it takes away, and there's a lot of highs and there's a lot of lows, and oh, yeah. um, it's just yeah. And he was able to, he's been able to ride that wave, and, you know, make a pretty good career of it. Oh, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so um, before we get into any kind of racing news, I don't think there's a whole lot. Um. I just wanted to thank everyone for listening and watching. If you haven't already, please hit like, hit subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also check us out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We've been looking at the numbers a little bit and definitely um, been pretty impressed with the amount of people that have been actively listening and how long people have been listening. Because, you know, there's a lot of instances for different videos and stuff. People just watch and listen to them for a couple minutes. Um, and we've seen pretty good numbers on that, so definitely appreciate it. And, um, yeah, we, we definitely have some more great ones coming up. I know we keep saying that, but we really do. Um, we have some real good ones coming up. Yeah, uh, another legend of the sport. If anybody oh, yeah. who watched our Mario, uh, and we featured Jagger Jones at the beginning of that, that was something I was very proud of um, to be able to present to people. And by the and, way, Jagger uh, said he was going to listen to the Mario interview. So I think we need to follow up to Jagger and make yeah, sure he actually we did. Need, we need to do a test. I know. I wish, on air test. I wish we could just call him into this podcast right now. Hey, Jagger, what are you doing? <laughs> what, what do we, what do we say? What do we ask Mario 12 minutes and 30 seconds into the interview? <laughs> right. Uh, you know, it, it uh, was really good. And, uh, 
you know, I, you know, like I've said on this show before, and I don't mean this in any way. If one person listens or a million people listen, I, it's not why I do this. No, and absolutely not. I, I, I love to hear just their stories. And of course, who has better stories about their career than Mario? And, uh, if, and if people are watching this who didn't look, watch that one, please go back and look at that one, the willpower or any of our, our previous ones, because we're proud of all of them. And um, they're just, uh, they, they all contain something in there. I think they can peel to just about anybody. Yep. And Mario's another one talking about inspiration. Um, you know, really what that guy went through in his life and, you know, kind of coming over to America with nothing and look where he is now. So, and, and that's really kind of the embodiment of the American dream, um, which, you know, obviously is a big inspiration to a lot of people. Yeah, I agree. And, um, I mean, I couldn't imagine losing, losing your country. Essentially, you know, that's essentially what happened at such a young age and having to come make a fresh start and, and uh, I would say that Mario's attitude and is what's carried him so far in life. And if you very humble, if you yes. go back and watch that and listen to it, that's uh, you get that uh, immediately from him. Absolutely. And we actually just interviewed somebody on Friday who's also extremely humble. And this is I, I consider him one of the um, almost one of the unknown faces of racing. He's heavily involved in stuff that, or was heavily involved in some stuff that you probably wouldn't even realize. I mean, that's one that, you know, definitely um, everyone will enjoy. And um, yeah, I agree. It's actually was heavily involved in a form of racing that you're extremely passionate about uh, midget racing, dirt track racing. Yeah, but, you know, in a broader scale, though, he was important to the entire realm of auto yeah. racing. Absolutely. Um, with his activities. So uh, we'll release that in three to four weeks and uh, very proud of that one also. And uh, although we ran literally in the same circles for 20 yeah, years, Scott, Scott was somebody I never out. met. Scott was geeking out a little bit in that interview. I I did get a chance to geek out. You know, this was somebody I've admired from afar and uh, mm-hmm. for many reasons. And I, I never had a chance to really talk to him. And uh, I think you'll see that in the, in the video where poor Aaron doesn't say too much and I do a nope, lot of I talking. just let, and, and, you know, that's more your, um, your expertise. I'm more, you know, always kind of been more geared towards IndyCar. I mean, I've, I follow, you know, midget racing, dirt racing, but definitely I haven't been involved or know as much or anywhere near as close as you. So that's why we have two people. That's right. Uh, there's a lot of things I don't know. So, um, but yeah, I was very, very, very happy to be able to talk to him and, um, and we're going to try to get more people like that on as well as we go along. And, uh, we just, we're, we're trying to vary up our guests and, uh, we've got a lot of different things planned. So please stay watching. And, um, and speaking of dirt racing, yeah. I know we're, um, looking forward to, um, hopefully doing the chili bowl deal again that we did. And last year we did it on a different platform. Um, so this will be the first year on the racer racer platform. But we're definitely looking forward to that. Um, it was tons of fun last year. I know definitely would like to get at least the same people we had on last year and definitely looking at getting some other people as well. Yeah, it, and uh, it, we, we did a live stream, uh, kind of a preview as the racing was going on on Saturday night. And uh, and we talked to people who were announcers there and Kim Stewart and talked to a driver who drove there. And we had uh, the legend David Land come in. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, he, you know, he was part of it and, uh, we just, we, we really had a great time just talking all motorsports and, um, and hopefully we, we can put together something similar. And if we get half the viewers we got last year, I'd be as happy. And we had like five or 600 views and, um, which I thought was great. So Man, I really David enjoyed Land it. On. Those views were bumping up. That's right. You know, everybody wants to hear what David has to say. Yes, yes, they do. Well, I don't well, think there's a whole, a whole lot of racing news. The Memo Gidley interview is a little longer, so we won't talk too much longer. But I think Formula One was at um, Brazil. Um, I almost forgot who won. Lewis Hamilton wins the race. Um, and I watch actually the majority of that race. I don't always watch all the Formula One race. I usually watch, you know, the beginning the, the grid the grid runs which i think are or grid walks which i think are kind of worth mentioning because there's been a lot of um, hype about that about 
celebrities and bodyguards, which now Formula One has a rule in place. People are calling the, you know, the Martin, um, Martin, um, Brundle. Blundell, thank you. Martin Blundell effect, um, which um, celebrities are not allowed to bring their bodyguards on the grid anymore. So that's kind of interesting because Megan the Stallion, I think is her name, um, kind of blew, blew him off and did not want to um, be interviewed by him. Well, it was really the bodyguards. I don't think she really cared. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a really weird thing. I mean, I think you got to, I think whenever you're there, you got to expect uh, it. I, I mean, mean, if you don't do it, you're in the spot. Yeah, anybody can live their life how you want. Yeah, right, I think you just got, uh, you know, if I, uh, but if I go to their thing, like if I'm doing it, this thing in this other world and face it, she's trying to get FaceTime with, I'm sure, the international crowd and, you know, with the biggest driver in the world, Lewis Hamilton. I'm sure that was part of it. And I don't blame anybody for not for wanting to be a part of that. Um, I think you just got to understand where you're at and, and be willing to, to talk, but you know, that's everybody's prerogative. Um, it's a so free whatever. country. Yeah. It is free country. And uh, yeah, Lewis Hamilton's straight up stud. He, you know, uh, F1, I think F1's tailor made for his style and how he races and, um, you know, there's always this talk about who's the greatest and who's the best. And I don't necessarily think that he could come to America and do some of the things like Kyle Larson has. Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. But at the same time, I think Larson could win in his equipment. I don't know if he could win as much as Lewis has won in Lewis's equipment. So um, with that being said, you know, he's greatest ever. Really, I mean, I don't know how you can't look at the numbers and see what he's done. And uh guy's got a little magic to him, right? And he he wins races. And, you know, was, and I think a lot of people are starting to think that, you know, it's Max for strapping to lose. And, I mean, he's still in in this, but Lewis is making it very apparent that um he's not going to let him go easy. Oh, no. I mean, I, I didn't expect him to. I mean, that um he's a fighter, man. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, don't so never, never think that to lose sprint, that sprint race. I mean, he was like a rocket ship. Yeah. Never think that Lewis Hamilton isn't a fighter because he is. I mean, it's, yeah, it's not all equipment. Oh, he's absolutely a fighter. Um, well, wait, is there any other news that we're missing? Yeah. I want to say, uh, to somebody I don't know, uh, but I want to say get well to Dave and Persley. Yeah, USAC sure. Midget Racer, um, unfortunately, was hurt in Arizona in a uh, very, very hard crash. I had some neck injuries. You can go out there and find – you can Google it. <laughs> I'm not going to speak on somebody else's medical condition, but um, but best wishes to Dazen and his family. And um, I have a, a small idea what they're going through, and these are tough days. Um, having someone you care about laid up in a hospital. Uh, so I wish them the best. And I, and I wish Buddy Kofoid the best. Him and Buddy are actually teammates. And they they got together uh, during that crash. And it was a racing deal. I mean, it's just unfortunately how it is. And so I wish Buddy all the best, too, because he's a very talented young man, as well as Dason yeah. is. So, uh you know, uh, auto racing is dangerous. I mean, that's a simple way of putting it, but it's, I don't care what anybody looks at this sport and thinks they should never be surprised when somebody gets hurt because it is a very dangerous sport and you can fool yourself all you want, but that's never going to change until they, until the day that autonomous race cars without drivers becomes a thing. It's always going to be a dangerous sport. That's a very good point. Very good point. Well, I think, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and um, jump right into Mimo Gitley, and I hope everyone enjoys. Yeah, please enjoy. And like Aaron said, please like and subscribe, and I hope everyone has a great week. Our guest today drove in Champ Car for several seasons and also drove in Grand Am Series. We are joined by Mimo Gitley. Hey, Mimo. Thanks so much hey. for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. 
but yeah, we met um, like it's it's been at least 12 years. We met like 12 years ago. Um, so um, it's definitely good to you know talk to you again and see you. And I'm, I, I doubt if you remember, but it was like 12 years ago and you sent me um, a pair of gloves in the mail. Oh, that's pretty cool. Where yeah. were they? I'm sorry, what's that? Where were the gloves from? Um, I don't know. They were from, I think just Grand Am. Um, mm-hmm. because you sent me, you sent me the gloves and then you sent me a bunch of promo cards, old promo cards. Um, but you have me email you. That's how I still have your email address. Sweet. I was like, I wonder if he still has the same email address. <laughs> yep, I do. <laughs> <laughs> But no, no, we appreciate you joining us. Um, so talk a little bit about how you first got interested in racing. Jeez. Um, I mean, it like goes all the way back to when I was like, uh, got a big wheel when I was like six years old. So we're racing big wheels in the driveway. And then, uh, then I got into BMX bicycles and, um, uh, started racing BMX when I was like 10 um, and then, uh, shortly after that got into dirt bikes and then that was really what I was loved as a kid was trying to get a dirt bike and saved up some money. My dad sponsored me a little bit and got into dirt bikes and then started racing dirt bikes until I was like 20 years old. Oh, wow. So what was the first time you actually drove or raced something with four wheels? The first time I went to my first IndyCar race when I was 20 years old and uh went down to uh Laguna Seca and watched the IndyCar race down there you know big names uh right. you know Mario Andretti Al Unser maybe senior Al Unser Jr you know all these big guys I knew nothing about any of them but I was walking through because I only that's the first race I'd ever been to never knew about car racing my family was not in car racing nobody had been a fan of car racing <laughs> and, walking through the paddock and then I picked up a flyer from the Jim Russell school. They were promoting the mechanics training program. Well, a lot of things, but one was looking for mechanics to work for free on their school cars. And then you, got to, instead of getting paid, you got to race once a month in the mechanics series. And so I was in junior college at the time and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was, you know, my latest was maybe I'll be a park ranger, <laughs> but <laughs> it wasn't too exciting. For me, it just kept me outside. But as soon as I got that flyer about being a mechanic at the Jim Russell School, I thought, this is it. I want to go race cars. And I knew nothing about the sport and how hard it was to get into or turn it into a profession. I thought, this is it. I saw all these big IndyCar races, IndyCar drivers and teams down there and at the Jim, at the Laguna Seca in like 1991, 1992. And I thought, this is, this is what I want to do is right here. So I sold everything I owned, and three months later, I was down there working uh, and doing the Jim Russell program, mechanics training program. What's funny is, is this is the second time we've basically heard a similar story, and the other person was Pete Halsmer, who raced in the you know seventies and he ran sports cars and you know early eighties and and uh, all that. And it's a very similar story. It's yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know his story. Um, he sounds like he was before me, but there's, it's rare, you know, I mean, car racing is so expensive to get into that yep. entry level steps, you know, like to go through a school and to run a school series is, you know, um, you know, somewhere around probably back then was like $60,000. And so, you know, um, that was one way into it. I'm glad to hear somebody else sort of did the same path. Yeah, he uh, his path was a little different. He actually, because he was quite a bit before you. Actually, he uh, he was drafted into Vietnam, and he also finished school at Purdue. Wow. Um, and then, but then he basically kind of did the same thing, though. He, you know, he went out, was a mechanic, and worked on the you know school cars and drove the school cars and that. So, wow. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was a great program. I mean, it's. You know, I mean, how how does a, you know, a 19-year-old or a 20-year-old that's never been into racing, I mean, even starting earlier than that, but how does a teenager or a young person, how do they, if they have no connections in racing and no money, you know, that was such a great program. I'm so sorry that it's not around anymore because not only did it help me as a driver, a few other drivers too, but also so many mechanics that I still know that work for IndyCar teams or Grand Am team, or, you know, or sport, whatever, you know, they work for 
uh, car racing team. So it's a way for people, was a way for people to get going. Right. Yeah. And it, and it is, a, it is a sport that, um, that has definitely a financial blockade and it's hard to find those alternate entrances into the sport. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> So from the Jim Russell School, so did you, what did you race after that? Did, did you go into USF 2000 or did you do any like go-kart racing? I, you know, I, everything, um, I was down at the Jim Russell School and there was a guy named George Barrows who was an instructor down there. And he was also sort of a famous go-kart racer at the time, at that, that era, you know. And so he was racing for Track Magic Go-Karts, which was based in San Francisco. And like I said, he was an instructor down there and he saw me, we never met, but he saw me come in there in the mechanics training program and then started me, uh, saw me start racing and uh, I think made a really good impression on him. And so, um, you know, I was wondering what steps were next. And he said, you should meet uh, Fausto Vitello, who owns Track Magic Go-Karts. And I, that's who I drive for. And I said, great you know, um, uh, set me up with that. And so, um, uh, I was able to meet, um, you know, Fausto attract magic and start moving into four wheels. Wow. Um, that's a that, great story, man. I yeah, mean, no, really is. it really is. I, I was looking up some stuff about you and I, and I've seen this before. There's a book about like cart racing with you. Um, was it written by you or you're at least on the cover of it? Yeah, it was written myself and another guy named Jeff Grist. But yeah, both of us, his idea, he came to me and said, hey, we want to do some go-kart, you know, I want you to do some, us to do some go-kart books together. And uh, so, yeah, we did it together. It was a, it was a cool project and we did like uh, four different books over, geez, it must've been over like eight years or something oh, wow. like that. I didn't realize that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, and surprising because there's no, either, there wasn't really any, many go-kart books out there. Um, so it was, uh, uh, it was just great to sort of get out there and just, uh, you know, sort of touch people and get them going in something fun like hearts. How did you, so, so once you started driving the cards, how did you work your way up into, you know, getting back into the, or getting to the, uh, higher series? Well, so I started with, like I said, I was introduced to, I graduated the mechanics training program and I won a bunch of races, which was great down there. I won like nine races out of 11. And so wow. my first one that I did down there, I won and which was good because there's some students that were already in the program for nine months because it sort of came, came sort of quarterly, you know? Mm. And so um, anyway, so then once I graduated there and was wondering how to make the next step, met Fausto Attract Magic through George Barrows. And uh, um, with go-karts, I hadn't, you know, I wasn't the kid that started racing go-karts when he was 10 years old. I mean, I was 20 years old when I first drove a go-kart. And um, uh, Fausto was just going on George's word. I had bought a go-kart when I was down at the Jim Russell School to get some seat time, you know. And, you know, although there wasn't much time to do it, um, but I was trying to get out to the tracks and get a little driving experience. And so um, Fausto said, hey, um, give me that go-kart you have. I'll give you one of our go-karts and we'll, we'll see how you do. And so, um, he gave me one of his go-karts in the first race. Um, actually, I think I almost crashed out their factory driver. <laughs> so I had no experience, but I was fast, you know, so I was up there and I think I beat, uh, their factory driver, their main guy who was with them and, uh, and then almost crashed him out too. So, um, that's, how I got started. And then, and then Fausto said, Hey, listen, I want to pay you to race go-karts. And it wasn't like, you know, a lot of money, but it was enough that that's all I needed to basically just live and race go-karts. And so even though I didn't start in go-karts when I was 10, I started when I was 20 years old, immediately um, around this area, region 11 made a big impression because I was driving for track magic and winning races and nobody I mean, nobody had ever seen me ever before. And so they had no idea who this guy was, you know? Um, and, you know, every step of the way was just something different, you know? I mean, Fausto, you know, we had a lot of good runs and go-karts. We won the um, the biggest race, you know, the, the next year after that, I was racing 125 shifters and uh, won the Super Nats, which is the big race down in Las Vegas. Right. And, um, um you know, he, we bonded really well. Like he turned, was really like a, 
father to me, kind of. I mean, I had a father, but he was just a really close family. And he knew I wanted to race cars. And so, um, and he wanted to help help that program. So he wanted to help sponsor me into car racing. So, you know, again, there's so many stories, but, you know, we were walking around um, Sears Point, looking, going through teams. And because I thought, oh, maybe I should race Formula Mazda, you know, which was the series at the time, very competitive. And we were walking around garages and we bumped into Steve Cameron. And Steve Cameron was uh, sort of still trying to be a race car driver, but also owned a team. And he said, well, you should do the Shelby Can-Am series. And he, he says, I happen to be a dealer in that. And he goes, maybe if you guys give me a go-kart, then I'll let you, I'll let you, I'll give you a test and see how you do. And so uh, Fausto said, no problem, gave him a go-kart. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I tested the car with Steve Cameron. And even though it was really, you know, only raced cars once, you know, season before in the school series, made a big impression with him right away in that. And uh, the next step was racing in the Shelby Can-Am Pro Series. Now, did you, I mean, obviously you have, you were able to make a, a big impression quickly. Had had that been the case in, you know, when you were racing BMX and, and motocross? You know, BMX, uh, I only did like four or five races in BMX. I did win my first race, but I think it was a little bit lucky because I think the leader crashed out or something like that. And then they bump you up to a faster class. So uh, I was competitive up there and I practiced all the time, but, you know, it just wasn't in it that long. And then motocross, um, definitely uh, I made an impression. I mean, we were, you know, my dad was a pipe fitter and my mom was a school teacher. So we were very, very low budget. Um, so low budget that my dad had a motorcycle that he pulled a trailer behind his motorcycle and he put my dirt on the back of that trailer. And oh, wow. riding on the motorcycle. So we used to camp out at the races to basically so I could be out there racing dirt bikes. And the first trophy I got from a motocross race was a guy who saw what was going on and saw me, not only all that, but also my boots that were like five sizes too big, my jersey that said Mako, which had nothing to do with the Honda I was driving, and you know, all this sort of free stuff. And so he actually bought me a trophy and he said, one day you're going to be a champion. And I still have that trophy today. Um, but so Dirt bikes uh, took me a little while to get going, but definitely I moved up and was, uh, you know, well-known sort of locally. I just didn't have the budget to go anywhere outside of California to go racing. Wow. That's a, uh, man, that's a hell of a story. Yeah. <laughs> we see a lot of like motorcycle guys today who, you know, who race motorcycles for 10, 20 years of their life, never get it, you know, never drive a, a car, race a car and they, they get into car racing and they're very successful. I mean, you know, thinking of people like, I don't know, like Ricky Carmichael, Jerry McGrath, Travis Pastrana, what is it you think with motorcycle racing that kind of, what, what about it you think kind of prepares you to drive a car? Well, I think it's so much of it is just mentally, you know, um, mm -hmm. feel, but also just mental. And I think the biggest thing with racing motocross is you're balancing um, on the edge if you want to, you know, if you want to like continue to get better or, or win races, right. you're balancing, you know, crashing essentially at the edge, crashing or riding the bike at the edge. But the difference between car racing and even go-kart racing and dirt bikes is that mm, when you step over the edge, then you definitely... You definitely on right. Your head. <laughs> right, right. So it's definitely there's more of a um, you know there's more of a uh, something that happens if you if you make a mistake or push it. But you know if you're doing it, like I said, competitively successfully, then you have to just that's just natural all the time on the edge, balancing that with the idea is yeah. I mean you're not even thinking about it, but if I crash, then it's going to hurt a little bit. You know, so. I think in go-karts or car racing, at least at the early levels, you don't really think of, you know, every time you make a mistake, you don't think I'm going to be, I'm, it's going to hurt, you know. Uh, yeah, you might hit the wall now and again, but a spin out on a track is nothing like, you know, uh, you know, being a little short on a double and just smashing <laughs> into the, into the uh, dirt, you know. So that's the biggest difference. And I think that's why a lot of people, and some of those, either whether it's motocross or anything that's sort of, you know, on the edge, you know, uh, where there's a definitely a possibility of getting hurt if you make a mistake, that definitely prepares you well for car racing. 
Right. I think for some people it definitely comes down to just having, you know, more balls and other people to really, you know, do stuff. I raced motocross one year and I got tired of hitting the ground. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I did it one time. Now my brother raced uh, in the end of the seventies and that, and he ran some pro-am and that, but it wasn't for me. And that really is why I never drove a race car too. Cause we had race cars in our family and I realized through my experience at seven years old, I was like, man, I, I don't have the mental toughness to do this. You know? <laughs> yeah. You got to really, you know, you just got to really like the competition and just the challenge, um, you know, getting into cars, it's just, it's not easier to sort of get to the top level, but it's definitely, um, you know, it definitely seems at least when you're learning, it definitely teaches you, you know, the desire that you need to sort of like, you know, um, push your way to the top, it seems. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. I absolutely agree. And I saw that my brother where my brother had way more what I felt determination. And I just knew it within myself. I was like, man, I don't have what he has, you know. Uh, he ended up running sprint cars and silver crown cars and that for 20 years. But, um you know, midgets, I should say, and silver crown cars for like 20 years. And I just, but I knew immediately before the age of 10, I was like, man, I ain't got that in me. <laughs> so, so when you, uh, so you did your test and that test went really well, I, I assume. Uh, where'd you kind of go after that? Yeah, that test went great. Shelby Can-Am series. And it was a really popular series then. Like a lot of series, you know, they last for like three or four years and they sort of peter off and change into something else. But there were like, uh, you know, 28 cars, I think, at the first race down at Phoenix. And the first race was on an oval. And so I was, and Fausto Vitello, who owned Track Badge at Go-Karts, they agreed to sponsor me in four races. I think it was like the tune of $40,000 for four races. And Fausto was also the owner of Thrasher Magazine and, you know, all the... Oh, wow stuff like independent trucks and everything that was associated. So he was kind of like the man in, in skateboards. So the car had Thrasher on it, had some, you know, eyeballs painted on it and some crazy stuff on it. But we went down to the first race with Steve Cameron, with Cameron Race, you know, it used to be called Steve Cameron or Cameron McGee Motorsports at the time. Joe McGee was also one of Steve's partners, vice versa. And we, I put the car on pole down there against like 28, 28 guys. So my first pro race, um, on an oval, first time on an oval, I started on pole and finished second. So it was like right away, like not only a lot of fun to be up there, but also just uh, made a big impression. And we, you know, other than the cars were a little bit unreliable, electronics would break, gearboxes would break. And so I was always in the hunt up at the front. And so after those four races were done, Fausto was like, hey, listen, I just was going to do four and that's it. And so then actually Steve um, and also Joe McGee, who's a really great individual who's not around anymore, uh, who owned the motorsports where Steve sort of worked for, um, they wanted me to continue racing because I was not only promoting the series, but the cars and also helping their other guys that were renting cars on their team. And so then they put together the funding with local people and themselves so that I could finish off the year in the Shelby Can-Am Pro Series. So um, that was kind of my first step. And then the next, then it was like, okay, so what do I do after this? And I had zero money and um, Fausto was limited on the budget that he was going to put in, although I was still racing go-karts. And um, that's when I was at a go-kart race and I won a race and somebody came up and talked to me, but he called me the next week and he said, hey, listen, I saw your race. I really liked what you did out there. And we talked and he goes, a friend of mine, guy named J.R. Parrish owns a real estate company and he's into Formula 4 2000 and I think you should meet him and I said hey do it let's do it set it up and I'll come down and meet him and uh, so the next year was or the next step was sort of like um, you know what should I do next and you know I met J.R. Parrish and he invited me out we hit it off right away and he invited me out to a test at Sonoma he had a couple of Formula 4 2000 cars he had one sort of younger guy, you know, sort of my age that he was supporting. And he gave me some laps in the Formula 4 2000. And then mm, I think like right away, I was faster than the guy that was, um, that he was sponsoring. So after that test, he called me up and he said, listen, um, you know, I want to help you. Um, I'll 
buy a car and I'll buy motors for you to race Formula Four 2000. And then you go do something with that. So, um, you know, I had that. I, I went back to Steve Cameron. I said, Steve, this is what I got. He said, well, there's some, a team I know, DD, uh, Rushton, DSTP Motorsports. They want to start a new team and they want to race Formula Four 2000. And they might be interested in paying for everything else because same thing, their team want to attract attention and they also want someone fast. And so then the next year I was racing Formula Four 2000 for DSTP Motorsports and DD Russian, which was another awesome, um, I mean, Formula Four 2000s at that time were, were huge. You know, the first race in Phoenix, I think there were 48 cars. And then the biggest race we had was one of our races at, um, Mid Ohio was during the IndyCar weekend, and there were 64 cars there, Formula Four 2000s, and 62 cars took the green flag for the race. Wow. So, yeah. So that was kind of the next series. That was definitely the next series I was in. And I, you know, I mean, I moved out to Sharp to um, uh, uh, somewhere in Ohio. I can't think of it right now, um, but moved out there and, uh, you know, lived with, uh, with the, uh, the, uh, sorry, Connecticut, Hartford, Connecticut. The team was based in Connecticut. So I lived out there, I actually drove across country in a U-Haul van and picked up this car that I was supposed to get and picked it up, drove it out there and then lived out there and, and competed in the, in the U.S. Uh, Formula Ford 2000 series that year, which was, which was unbelievable. <laughs> just, just uh, opportunities and determination. Yeah. Just a lot of, yeah, definitely a lot of good opportunities. And then just, you know, I was just out there. I think the, you know, definitely the motocross, you know, working on my own things, you know, rebuild, whatever, doing my own program when I was a kid really taught me to kind of put the work into, um, especially if you don't have a budget, you have to really sort of put the work into to, um, you know, to make up for it. So um, it was just, you know, in Formula Four 2000, again, another great, I think the first race I finished second, but then I, uh, you know, won races, was leading the championships, uh, won the night before Indy, um, uh, you know, Formula Four 2000, like one of our races with, was at the uh, Oval there. And sure, IRP. Won the yeah. night before Indy, and then uh, I didn't lose the championship until the last lap of the last race. <laughs> so oh. it was breaking. But I was definitely uh, an unknown, but getting more better known, but an unknown that all of a sudden was, was doing pretty well in cars too. So what would you consider was your big break? Oh, geez. There's just so many. I mean, there's just so many. I mean, it's. Well, I, I guess what I should say is like when you really start entering the professional level. You know, it's, uh, it's like every step of the way. I mean, you know, going from um, literally um, nobody in go-karts or car racing. And then, and then, uh, you know, we, me, winning the Jim Russell championships in mechanic. Yeah. That was people knew some people knew about it, but then to get into go-karts and then a couple years later to win, um, uh, the super nationals, which is the biggest race in the U S. Um, yep. right. that was huge because I was not a go-karter. I mean, I had only started a couple years before, and so I wasn't really a go-karter, but all of a sudden I just won the Supernats with Track Magic. You know, whether it's that or, um, you know, bumping into um, Steve Cameron and getting a, getting a test there or, you know, the DSTP, the Formula 4 2000 or Toyota Atlantic, you know, Lynx Racing, um, you know, Peggy Haas, Jackie Doty. Um, Peggy is a local woman in the Bay Area here where I live, and she was sponsoring a Toyota Atlantic team and putting only drivers in that she felt needed the funding. So how does a guy like, you know, myself come up with, um, you know, even then, I think it was like nearly a million dollars for one car, Jeez. one car wow. in the series. How does someone like myself come up with that kind of money? That was huge. Right. Or, you know, once I sort of passed through the Toyota Atlantic series and, you know, I'm walking around looking for a ride. I, there was Derek Walker and his Japanese driver broke his leg. And so they gave me a test. They narrowed it down to two people. They gave me a test. Even though I was fastest, they still asked me, can I bring some money because they needed budget? And I said, they said only $300,000. And I was like, $300,000 might, might as well be $30 million because right. there's no right. way. But yeah. um, 
you know, Honda of Japan um, decided um, that they wanted to put me in the car. So even though I wasn't Japanese and uh, didn't have any money, um, you know, Honda of Japan put me in my first Indy car. So there's just so many, um, you know, so many opportunities like that, that, that people just helped out. So it's really, uh, really made a difference, you know, every step of the way. Sure. Sure. At one moment when you were in, so we interviewed um, Jimmy Kai, for example, and he was talking about how when he got his first IndyCar test and I think his first race was at like Phoenix, he said he, he kind of had a moment when he was driving through the pits and he looked over and he was passing like, you know, Ari Leindyke's pits and, you know, other big names like that. Did you have a moment like maybe in 99 where you were like, I can't believe I'm racing against, you know, some of the biggest names of the sport? You know, I respected all those guys, um, but I just, you know, the thing is, is I wasn't following them since I was a kid. When I went to my first, you know, when I went to Jim Russell school, the first time I remember the first lunch, we were down there and, uh, you know, everybody's getting to know one another and they're uh, asking, saying who their favorite drivers are. And they came around to me and they said, who's your favorite drivers? I said, I don't know any drivers. I don't know any of the drivers, you know, who they are. So. Like I said, it's not disrespect for those guys, but I never really, um, uh, I don't think I ever really felt was out there and was like, wow, this is really me out there. It just, it just felt um, just pretty natural and just very comfortable. Yeah. And that's probably the best way to be, you know, honestly, I mean, you just, because without that, you don't have any preconceived notions. You don't have any you know, concepts of what it should be like. You just do your thing and, and go from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, those guys were funny. You know, at that lunch, I'll never forget it. They were like, well, you don't know who, you don't know who Al Luncer is? And I'm like, I have no idea who that is. And, uh, <laughs> so they were like, this is crazy. This guy, he doesn't know anything about it. He's, he doesn't know anything. You know? And I was like, okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it is kind of nice to go into. And the same thing from a money standpoint. I mean, honestly, you know, frankly, if I was... 20 years old if i'm 20 years old before i went down there um i actually knew some people kind of that had done some car racing maybe and also other people and so i i sort of took a poll and i asked people what they thought of my idea and you know a good portion of the people said forget it you don't have any money you don't have any name in racing like forget it you know you're not gonna don't even think about doing it but because i knew so little about racing and how hard it was to you know sort of get through it I said, forget it. And I just went down there and did it, you know, or started it. So. Right. I mean, that's probably the best way to do it, to be honest with you. I think so. Yeah. So the second half of 99, you drove for um, paid in coin racing, right? Yes. Yeah, I did. I did three races with uh, Derek Walker, which was awesome because they were front running winning. You know, they had, my teammate at the time was Jill DeFerrin. And was awesome, you know, like fantastic driver, great individual. And I think they were leading the championship. And so, you know, after my three races there, then um, then all of a sudden I started getting some attention. Because like in the second race that I was at at Road America, I think I qualified like fourth or fifth, something like that. And that was with 28 cars, you know. So you look down, look down the list of the drivers and you're like, well, wow, that's pretty good considering you didn't really you know, you were only in, you only went to your first car race like seven years ago, you know, you hadn't. So. <laughs> right. And then teams started to take notice, you know, Dale Coyne, they were um, running Michelle Jourdain and it was sponsored by Herdez. And so they were looking to get a second car to go with Michelle to sort of like help the progress and just see what they could do, you know, with two cars. Um, so, so yeah, after Derek Walker, Walker Racing, then I was signed up to do six races with, um, Dale Coyne, which was also, you know, a good experience with him for sure. What was that like to, was, was, um, Walter paid in around a lot? He was not, and, you know, it was, I, you know, I don't know, I'm trying to think, but I don't think I ever really met him. Oh, wow. So he wasn't around. I mean, Dale was great. I really liked being around Dale. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, like, um, he's a pretty, very smart guy. And, but back then it was definitely like the low budget team, you know, like they weren't in a position like they are, seems like now where they actually have a right. shot to run at the front. 
back then it was very, very low budget. So for me, it was like going from one of the best teams, Walker Racing at the time, to Dale Coyne. Dale Coyne was kind of like, you know, not the highest budget team. But I never, I never met um, uh, Dale. I think it was his partner at the time, but I never, or tied into the team. I never met him, uh, Walter Payton at that time. I don't know if he was sick then or not. I don't, I don't know if he was already sick by that time or, or if that was still a couple of years away. Yeah. I'm trying to think, was that before or after, but I just, I don't remember either. Yeah. I don't either. Well, I mean, you know, it's pretty incredible. So you're two, one year in champ car and then your second year you drive for, um, I mean, arguably one of the biggest champ car teams of all time, um, for, players for Sly racing um so i mean that's gotta i mean like you said at this point you've been driving a car for what eight nine years and you're literally like with w one of the top teams yeah no it was great i mean it was great and then you know the um the next year i mean after dale coins six races you know a lot of these teams they would love to continue to run but they didn't have programs that i could right. sort of you know didn't have budgets or programs for me to run so then, you know, after the the last race I did with with uh, Dale Coyne, then I'm and I'm living out in India at that time. You know, I load. It was actually pretty funny. The first um, <laughs> I wanted to be where the team was based, and so the the first race I did with with um, with Derek Walker was up in Portland. And so I think the test where they decided I could I was going to race happened about two weeks or a week before. Two weeks before was the test. And a week before the race, they said, yeah, we want you to race. And I said, okay, I'll be out there. And so I literally loaded up my pickup truck with my go-kart and the few belongings I had. And I drove out to Indy and I drove into their parking lot and I went inside and I said, hey, the receptionist, I said, hey, I'm Memo Gidley. I'm here. You know, and they said, oh, great. Oh, she said, you should have called. We would have come pick you up at the airport. And I was like, airport? I said, I drove out here. And they're like, no way, you drove there. So like everybody in the facility came outside and was looking at my truck that was loaded with parts and bicycles and all sorts of stuff. And they couldn't believe that I actually drove out to Indy. So there was definitely like people were start, starting to take notice, you know, um, including media people like Robin Miller. You know, what a fantastic individual. And he told me the first time he, I think we with Derek Walker, he, he um, printed or put out that Mamo Gidley was going to be driving for Derek Walker and somebody wrote in and said, oh great, just what we need another foreigner that's in the that's in the IndyCar series because of my first name. And and so then Robin said he, he, you know wrote back how you've got to be kidding. He is about as he, there's he's definitely not foreign. He's he drove his pickup truck out here with with his go-kart in the back and he's as American as they come, you know. So it was definitely like starting to sort of get noticed and, you know, doing the, between the Walker or the Dale Coyne. Then the next year though, I had no, I had no, no seat, you know, no opportunity mm -hmm. yet, nothing. And then right before Long Beach, literally like the Wednesday or Thursday before Long Beach was Wednesday before, uh, they called me from, um, from the uh, players team, players foresight team and said, Hey, Patrick Carpentier, fell on his bicycle and broke his wrist do you want to do long beach and i said yeah I'll do long beach. <laughs> so but i hadn't been in a car for like geez at least six or seven months in indycar and so you know i went down to long beach you know uh friday practice and um i wish everybody could could experience what those indycars were like then because they were like close to 950 horsepower and they were like unbelievable beasts and even yeah, though, just animals. Yeah. 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 Even though I'd driven the car nine races the year before, I hadn't driven for six or seven months. And I got into that sucker down in Long Beach. And I was like, I mean, I couldn't even hold the thing wide open down the straightaway at first. I mean, it was so unbelievably fast. <laughs> Mind has to like start slowing down again, you know. But, you know, that, you know, even with a limited time down there, um, I qualified ahead of uh, Alex Tagliani was the other player's driver. So I qualified one place ahead of him. And I think I qualified like 13th out of like 28 or 11th out of 28 cars. And then that race, I actually got up to like fifth or sixth. And then with pit stops actually came out and was up leading the race and then ran out of fuel. So uh, uh -huh. 
those were my first laps led was with a player's team and Patrick's, you know, he was a friend of mine. I knew him, but I wish his wrist didn't heal as quickly. <laughs> right. I did get three races out of it, but then I was again out of a ride, you know, after three races in, in 2000. Yeah, that uh, those cars, man. You watch those old videos, and those things just leap off the corners on the road course. Where to, you know, today's cars, they don't accelerate. Obviously, don't accelerate near as hard. And, um, and, and you know, without watching them back to back, it's hard to tell. But it is, man. You go back and watch those old videos, and those things were just animals. They were beasts. I mean, we were like close to seventeen thousand RPM. You know, in right. they'd open you up to like sixteen eight. And, um, you know, we were like 930 horsepower and you look at the, I mean, I always get a chuckle out of it because I look at lap times now, like, uh, you know, whether it's road America or whatever, and I think we're still a little bit faster. <laughs> so, I think so. We didn't have the downforce, but we definitely had the horsepower and those cars, man, with the turbo pop, every time you shifted and just the RPMs, they were they were brutally fast, you know, just really fun to drive if you can hang on to those things, you know. So, <laughs> so, um, so 2001 was really um, kind of your big year in Champ Car. You had three podiums, obviously you're with Chip Ganassi Racing, also, you know, probably probably the top team back then. Um, and you, did you come, you didn't do the whole season with him, did you? It was the second half? No, I didn't. But the year before, also, one of the other teams that I ran with is even though I did the three races with mm -hmm. um, with uh, players, then John De La Pena, um, De La Pena Motorsports, the direct TV car, he noticed me. And so then he uh, had me come out and do a test. Uh, a um, road, a um, He wanted me to actually fill in for the ovals because their Argentinian driver had had some crashes and was just like a little gun shy on the ovals. But we went out to Road America and I said, hey, listen, I'll do the I'll do one day of the test, but I don't want to do the first day because I don't want to set the car up and make everything really good. I'll do the second day. So we did the second day. And after that, John said, hey, I want you for the rest of the year. So we did six. I did six races with him and then sort of similar. And he was a great what a great individual. I mean, he was like such a working class kind of team. And he just was like all about winning, wanting to win so badly. Um, so, but it was after that year, after his, you know, six races, then I'm out of a ride again, uh, you know, for six months or something like that. You know, the 2001 season had already started. I was living out in Indy, you know, I mean, the reason I lived out in Indy, um, during the season is because then I could drive to the races and be seen, you know, like I couldn't, I didn't have the money to fly. So I could drive to races by being centrally located there. And, you know, when I was at those races, I mean, uh, I'm not much of a salesman, but I definitely wanted people to see me. And so I would, you know, if there were three entrances into the pit, I was at one entrance in practice one, I was one entrance in practice two, and I was, you know, so I always like made sure everybody that was there, all the teams, and I'd walk down pit lane before the start of the start of the practice or whatever, actually down pit lane and look in all the, all the um, you know, little booths, the pit booths, and make sure everybody saw me. And I think that definitely helped because then um, after, you know, 2001 season started, then Mike Hull, who manages um, Ganassi's team, he called me and said um, they were firing one of their drivers and Nicholas Manassian, and then they wanted me to um, get in the car. And they called me at like, he called me at like six o'clock at night or seven o'clock. I was just coming out of the gym. I said, great, I'm coming down right now. He said, he said, no, no, you can wait till tomorrow. I go, well, are you sure? Because I just want to make sure that the opportunity is still going to be there tomorrow. And Mike was like, don't worry about it. Just sleep, sleep well. The opportunity is there. We want you to drive for us. So just come down tomorrow. So, um, so I went down and sat down with them. And, and yeah, that was with Ganassi Racing, you know, the, one of the biggest, most successful teams uh, in IndyCar racing at the time. Um, when, so when did the, so somewhere along, I think 2000 was the first year you attempted to qualify for the 500, right? Yeah. So how did that kind of come across or how did that come about, um, you know, trying to drive in the 500? So that was actually right before, uh, the players team called me up to come race Long Beach, mm -hmm. um, in Patrick Carpentier's car, but I was out at Indy and I was like, you know, it was like, what do I do? I was without a ride. And so I was trying to get opportunity to do something. 
And so it was like, oh, maybe I can get my rookie test because the IRL had just started up, uh, you know, within a year or two before, or two years before. And uh, that'd be great. Well, yeah, but people are wanting like $50,000 for a rookie test or something like that. So I was basically just, just walking around there looking for something. And uh, one of my good friends and also who was my manager at the time was Donnie Graves. And somehow he made contact with um, uh, Brayton, um, Scott Brayton. And they had, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of their primary driver. They were doing the normal primary IndyCar stuff, testing or whatever. And, uh, but they also had this old, I think it was an old Delara or something like that. And they thought, yeah, you can, you know, we'll put him in that and he can try and pass his rookie orientation in that. Well, the first day of rookie orientation had already gone by and it's usually a two day thing. So um, I got there uh, that night and we poured a seat into the car and it didn't get finished until about, I think, 10 or 11 o'clock the next morning, which was the second day of rookie orientation. Um, but went out on the track track and uh this i mean this car was old it was like i swear it seemed like the bodywork was flapping like it just like really old and uh luckily uh it would go 215 miles an hour because uh i went through all the stages um and was done with my rookie orientation in an hour and a half and um um they actually uh, except for the last two stages they would just say okay do the next speed do the next speed do the next speed and like I said, the last speed was, I think, was 210 through 215. You had to hold that average. The fastest my car would go was 215 miles an hour. But no problem, you know, past the rookie orientation on that old car. And, uh, um, you know, that was awesome to, to get out there and do laps on the speedway for sure. Was that your first time on an oval? I, no, I'd done ovals in um, Shelby Can-Am and then also oh, okay. Four, okay. Formula 4 2000. Oh, and yeah, IRP. Like, Yep. Yep. And then even the IndyCar stuff, like uh, what was called Champ Car, then um, uh, you know, I did like Michigan, some big, 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 fast stuff. You know, so I was used to the speed for sure. So those guys called me, and then I started racing for Ganassi. Like I said, the Nicholas Manassian, he went a different way, and so I went the first five races, I think, uh, in the 2001 series, and um, my first race is at Portland, and uh, you know, Port, you know. It was, I think that I was just getting used to everything. Like I said, I hadn't been into, in a car in like six or seven months, six months at least. And, you know, the thing with all of my racing in the IndyCar stuff, it was like testing, win, you know, like no testing, you know, like um, there was nothing. And so um, the first race I actually got run into by Tony Kanon. I qualified near the back and got run into by Tony Kanon. So it took me out of the race. And Ganassi's deal was, it, it was race by race. He was like, you know, I'm going to renew your contract race by race. And that's how it's going to, that's how it's going to be. And, uh, you know, uh, and he sort of let everybody know that. And so like the media was always asking me and I said, Hey, I don't care either way. Race by race is fine with me. And so then the next race was Cleveland and Cleveland, it was sort of a wet qualifying. And I qualified like, I think seven, six or seventh or eight, something like that. And then, man, I was just getting in the groove and the thing started hooking up and just feeling good. And so I actually got up into the lead. And so then I'm leading Cleveland, you know, and like I said, I mean, you look at the names that were in the series. I mean, IndyCar is very competitive right now. I definitely have a lot of respect for it. But back then also, you know, you look at the names that were in the series, it was amazing, you know. And so um, I was leading. I mean, I was leading the race. And so some people were on fuel mileage, fuel mileage and I wasn't, you know, some were on just running as fast as you could. And I was running as fast as I could. And I think I was out in front by like, 25 seconds at one point or something like that and uh you know we came in towards the end for a pit stop for a splash of fuel i came back out i think i was in like fourth and i had like 20 laps to go and i passed and caught all the way up and uh caught all the way up to dario franchitti who was leading it and uh basically finished second by two tenths of a second so it was just you know half a car width length up on him at the finish so as my second race in the series, you know, uh, to be on the podium yeah. or the race with Ganassi to be on the podium, they were, they were real stoked, real happy. And, uh, um, you know, it was, it was, uh, definitely very memorable, uh, experience for sure. Was it frustrating? Um, and I, and I, you know, to, I hate to ask this question, but was it frustrating to be kind of that guy who kept showing, Hey man, I am really fast. 
But at the end of the day, they were like, well, you're kind of a replacement driver. Yeah. And, and I mean, was, what, do you, what do you think that was? I mean, were they just – they wouldn't commit to you? Well, you know, it was – they were um, – it was just – it was just very competitive and there was just, you know, you're still looking for opportunities to get in. And I was still the new person. I mean, you look at the list of guys that were in sure. the series then. I mean, they had, not only were they fast, but they had years of experience, you know? So I was just sort of like, you know, like I said, the first, first year I went from like, you know, three races and five races, eight races. And the second year I had like, like, uh, you know, 12 races and then, with Ganassi, now all of a sudden, this is 2001, now all of a sudden, you know, not only did I almost win the second race, but I almost won uh, Michigan. If the oil, if I didn't have to come in and put oil in three times, I led a bunch of laps there. I almost won Chicago, finished second there. I mean, finished on the podium at Laguna Seca. And these are all like, all of a sudden, it's like, I was, I was right there, you know? And again, I think a lot of people didn't realize, some did, but there was no testing program. I never once was did a test day with Ganassi Racing. Like never once did I have a, you know. So um, you know that's that was when you look back on it, when I look back on it that was you know I picked it up pretty quick, and then and then that's two thousand one, and then you know we were racing over in over in Germany. Um, we raced worldwide in, in Champ Car at the time, and we were over in Germany, and that's when nine eleven happened. And all of a sudden, it went from 28 or 29 cars. And I was sure that next year I was going to get a full-time ride. And then it went down to the teams or the series actually, you know, um, not even being able to produce 18 cars. You know, like barely – at first, it was like they weren't going to make the bare minimum that the promoter even required to do a race. So all of a sudden, those opportunities, for me, they're, you know, they're – there weren't, they weren't out there, you know? I mean, it was just, it was like uh, the great depression of racing, you know? I mean, it was like stuff just closed down, you know? So it wasn't people didn't, or teams didn't want to keep me going or get out there. I didn't have great relationships with everybody. It was just financially, economic times were, were horrible, you know? And so that's what kind of took me out in uh, 2001 or 2002. There was, there was no opportunities, not for me, you know? We had a, I just started a, a motorsports based business where we're more of the open wheel market, midget sprint car type market. And, and uh, we bought CNC machines and, and 9 11 happened. And all of a sudden, this boom period in, in the country and in motorsports just started kind of going away. And it yeah. was, you know, and we finally closed the business like in 2017, but we really never recovered from it. You know, it was just because everything we had had, we based off that. And like you said, it just all started just kind of going away. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was, you know, I didn't know what, I, you know, what to do or what I was going to do. And, you know, 2002 came along and I had nothing, you know, nothing at all, you know. So, um, you know, I was tr trying to. I think I did a Trans Am race with Paul Genalozzi's team one and with Ace Hardware, but sponsorship that my manager had put together. And then, uh, you know, had nothing really in 2002 or 2003. And then 2004, uh, I, I turned into a friend of mine or a guy who turned into a friend, uh, Greg Packman, called me and he was, uh, uh, he flew in the Air Force Reserve. And so he was then uh, also a racing uh you know, not loved racing. And so he was putting together a program for the Air Force Reserve with a Ford Focus. <laughs> so he was like, do you want to do it? And I had nothing going on. I went out and met him. And he was a great guy. And, you know, so I went from basically driving Chip Ganassi's IndyCar to racing a Ford Focus uh, in right. a couple of years. And that's, that was my next, my next move. <laughs> so. But, you know, I mean, you kind of found a home in sports car. So finally, right. I mean, is, yeah. you know, that's kind of where you made me not where you ultimately at first wanted to be, but that really seemed to be where you found your home and found your, your footing in the sport. Yeah, no, it was, I mean, uh, you know, that, that first year I raced the Ford focus, then um, actually uh, uh, Paul Genalozzi was actually also racing an IndyCar team then or running an IndyCar team. And so there was one, 
uh, one of his drivers uh, couldn't do a race, and so they called me and uh, did good. And, uh, you know, hadn't been in a car for a couple of years, two and a half years, and went to a street course and uh, said, hey, I'd love to do another race. And then he called me back the next weekend for Vancouver or a couple weekends later. And now I at least had a, a, a decent, you know, some sort of um, real, some experience, not too far experience where I'd been in the car. And so then Vancouver, um, you know, the series was back running. Guys like Sebastian Bourdais, you know, it was very competitive out there. And I uh, qualified fifth that weekend. And actually that weekend I was racing the, the Champ Car and the Ford Focus. I was racing the Champ Car in Vancouver and the Focus in Portland. So I was flying back and forth on this little uh, little plane to get to both races. And then also in Vancouver that weekend was the um, Grand Am series, which was the Daytona prototypes. Right. And so that's when Steve Cameron was running a team and saw me out there. Um, actually, so sorry, no, actually they were running Pro Mazda that weekend, but he was running a kid in Pro Mazda. And so they saw me out there racing and saw me all of a sudden back in Indy cars and being fifth. And they were putting a program together to race in the Grand Am Series the next year. And Steve, Steve and I were friends and went way back. And so um, that definitely opened up opportunity for me to get into the Grand Am Series in 2006. It was awesome, you know. Yeah. Um, well, one thing I was going to ask, so you drove for the Playboy Racing Team. And I mean, that's got to be any guy's dream in racing, right? To drive for the Playboy Racing Team? I would at least think so. You see my head going up and down? <laughs> <laughs> I remember going to the Grand Am race in mid-Ohio, and that's probably the first time I ever met you. And um, I, I just remember they, I mean, they had a big deal. I mean, they have like, you know, six or seven playmates there. I know, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had, so you ever... they, had, <laughs> they had after parties, you know, and uh, I don't think I ever bitched about you know, attending an after party, they were definitely, definitely well worth uh, going. And, uh, but they were I'm guessing you weren't married when this was going on. Right. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Big support. You know, they were playboy, you know, they were just big into it and they were just, you know, they were all in, you know, like I said, they had, they had, uh, like you saw at mid Ohio, but they had playmates at a lot of the races. They had a special bus and they had like after parties and, and, uh, you know, it was, it was great. I got to go to the mansion a couple times, which was awesome. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. I, uh, last time I was in California, I drove by the mansion, but I, uh, you know, of course they were doing a lot of renovation and stuff and you, obviously you can't see it from the road, but, uh, yeah, no, I, and, uh, I was actually with, uh, uh, PJ Jones at the time and we were just killing time and we're in that area. I said, Hey, where's the mansion at? And he said, I think it's back here. So we drove back there and, I said, I said, did you ever get to go to the mansion? He goes, I was never invited. I said, a California kid, racer, could not get invited to the mansion. That had to be frustrating. He just laughed. But yeah, uh, it was great to get there. It's also, you know, meeting, you know, Hugh used to come out to some of the have to come out to some of the races, and he was just a real kind of casual guy, uh, just sort of nice to have around. And but yeah, getting into the mansion, I mean, come on, I got. I still got documentation of that somewhere down on my trophy wall somewhere. So <laughs> nice. Nice. Oh <laughs> no, that's gotta be. Did did you get to go to any of the cool like what what are some of the big they do like a big what like Halloween party? Well or New Year's or something. One of the uh one of the uh hold on just a sec, guys. Very good. My uh my computer wasn't plugged in. It's plugged in now. The um, yeah, one of the uh, one of the tragic parts of that of when I raced for Playboy is I was as the other drivers and some members of the team we were invited to his. I think it was Hugh's seventieth birthday party. I believe it was his seventieth, and it was um, uh, basically like three girls to one guy. That was the ratio of who was invited. So, and it was a it was a lingerie party or a pajama party, lingerie party. And that was after um, we were racing Long Beach that weekend. So it was like the, the Saturday night after Long Beach or something like that. Mm, that's one of the crashes I had at Long Beach when brakes failed. And so then I went smashing into a barrier. And so I was uh, obviously had a little fracture in my back. So 
I couldn't go to his, his camera party, his lingerie party, even though I had like my silk, you know, I had my silk. <laughs> and so I had everything like all picked out. So all I could do was when I was lying on the hotel in the bed, I just laid those pajamas over the top of me and I just like imagined that I was there. That was that was something that I just oh I was so unhappy that I missed that. <laughs> oh man. Oh man, that's awful. Yeah. The uh, that uh I mean somebody could have just loaned you a back brace or something. I mean, just to get you over there. I know, I know, seriously, I know, I know. It was, it was, I saw pictures. I was like, oh my God, that's so good. <laughs> that's so funny. Missed that one. Yeah. No, I'd say, unfortunately, you missed out on that one. Yeah. So you obviously, after that, I think it was what, like 06, 07, Playboy? Yes. Um, so after that, you raced, you know, several more years. Obviously, 2014, you have the bat wreck at Daytona. Um, and what, so what was that like afterwards, kind of the, the recovery process? That was kind of like a three-year process, right? It was a long time. Around. Yeah. I raced in the Grand Am, just to go back a little bit, but I did race up a race for Steve and I raced for Kevin Doran and, uh, the Kodak car and then also the McDonald's car. So I had a couple great seasons with him. He's another one of those guys that, man, he's a working class guy. He's, uh, you know, used to race, races dirt track himself. And then uh, cars are prepped like amazing. So I actually got a couple of years with him. And then uh, he sort of shut down and I was looking for opportunities. And then Bob Stallings called me up and said, hey, we want to put you in as, a, as the third driver. I think it was 2013. And so I did that. And then, uh, then uh, another as the driver for Daytona in 2014 and then had that wreck. Um, and the... Uh, and the recovery from that was was pretty gnarly. It was um, I mean a lot of great support. I mean I always told people. I mean it's so lucky because you know there's plenty of people in this world that you know uh, are just living their lives and they have things like this happen to them and they have nobody reaching out to help them. You know um, their support or just you know uh, get well or things like that. But I was definitely got a lot of fan support, well-wishers, and people's, you know, checking in. And then also, you know, whether it was the Grand Am series or um, Bob Stallings or, you know, John Gorsline, uh, all the people that were sort of behind me, they, they took care of me. But, you know, just to give people an idea of what it was like, you know, I mean, I, uh, well, it took me two months to get home, first thing, you know, it took me two months before I was actually home because, uh, you know, I was in hospitals and surgeries and this and that, whatever. And then um, when I did get home, uh, you know, I was like, okay, you know, I want to start going to the gym. But I was in so much pain at that time because of the nerve pain. And it was, um, you know, like just to get my, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife or my mom to drive me to the gym. I had to get them to drive me to the gym because I couldn't drive. I wasn't cleared to drive. And they'd run over just those little reflectors on the freeway, the ones you normally run over, they'd run over those reflectors. And um, I, it, it hurt so bad that, you know, I actually, you know, yelled at them and brought them to tears a couple of times. So it was so painful. And it was like, you know, it was like, if you can imagine someone taking a ball peen hammer and just like smashing you in your, oh. tongue, you know, if someone runs over one of those reflectors, sometimes your reactions are not what your normal reactions are. It's just yeah. you can't control yourself. Um, and so it was, you know, like I couldn't sit down. I couldn't, I mean, I ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner lying on, lying on my stomach on a massage table. I ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner for eight months. You know, like I couldn't sit in a chair for a year and a half. And even when I first started going to the gym for a while after, I couldn't drive myself there and I couldn't undress myself and I couldn't dress myself either, or I couldn't shower myself. You know, we had to go into a group shower. Because I wanted to get into the pool. Obviously, I couldn't pump iron or lift weights because I, I couldn't lift anything. You know, it was very fragile. But I wanted to get into the therapeutic pool. So I got into the therapeutic pool where it's warm and you can kind of move around. And, uh, um, you know, that was sort of the, the beginning of my um, recovery. But it was, it was, you know, it was definitely, it was a long one for sure. Bones healed fast. You know, all my bones healed fast. But the nerve pain, because I had scar tissue around one of my... Uh, fractures in my back, scar tissue, around, and it was just so painful. And and uh, 
there was nothing, you know, I tried everything. I mean, I did Chinese herbs, I did acupuncture, I did hyperbaric chamber, I did cryotherapy, I did, um, um, uh, I got a medical marijuana card so I could get some CBD. Um, you know, I did all this stuff to try and alleviate the pain and nothing would alleviate the pain. I'd be in the exact same pain for like three or four months. And then I'd wake up the next day and all of a sudden something would be a little bit different, but it would go in those stages of like three or four months, three months before anything would change. And I would be thinking, is this like, is this it? This is as good as it gets right now. This is what I'm going to be dealing with. And the doctors were like, Hey, don't, don't, the pain's going to be there for the rest of your life because nerve pain, they can't get a race, a rape away from, uh, can't get rid of scar tissue that forms around nerves because scrape it or get rid of it. Then it just, it just comes back. So they didn't give me a whole lot of, which is fine. Um, they didn't give me a whole lot of hope that anything was going to change. It just somehow things just slowly started changing. So, and then, you know, the thing that took me, you know, nearly three years is the back, all the bones. And I had like 12 broken bones um, and all the bones heal in like a couple months. I was healed from a bone standpoint, but the burst fracture in my back, uh, which the first surgery out in Daytona was done. It takes a year for that to potentially heal. Like that's not something that heals in six weeks. It takes like a year for that to heal. And so, you know, I went a year doing, you know, doing everything I could and uh, trying to let everything heal, but it didn't quite heal how it should. Mm -hmm. And I needed a referral for another doctor, not an Indy, a doctor out here. And so I was referred to another doctor out here. And by the time I contacted the person, made a, a checkup and then scheduled a doctor's appointment, that was nine months later, and then another year to heal from that. So that was the biggest um, healing time. Other than the nerve pain was there. It was just slowly it was getting better and better, but the biggest thing was just having to schedule again another, another back surgery just to do something to make me, make me good. How did you mentally deal with that? Um, I mean, what, how did you focus? Did you just focus all your attention on trying to get healthier or what was that process like? Because that's an easy tightrope to fall off of. Yeah, it was, you know, people were like, oh, were you, you know, were you, were you, uh, anxious to get back driving. And I was like, and I basically, I wasn't, I mean, my whole thing was, yeah, driving was so secondary at that point in my mind, but I was so weak. I mean, I was just so not, not used to doing what I normally do did, you know, I mean, I was go-karting, I was jet skiing, I was mountain biking, I was in the gym, I was swimming laps, I was, you know, sailing, racing, I was doing cars, you know, all this stuff. And now all of a sudden, I was doing none of that. And I just didn't have, you know, I couldn't because I was in pain and I just couldn't move. So it was like, that was the number one, my number one priority is that I wanted to get strong again. And that's why, like, as soon as I got home, I'm sure it was within a week after I got home, I was like, or probably days after I was like, I want to go to the gym. You know, I want to get in that pool and start moving around, you know, and, um, and because I want to get stronger, it wasn't about wanting to get back in to a race car. It was, you know, I want to get back stronger so I can start living the life that I want to live. And that was my, you know, that was my motivation right there. Yeah. I mean, that's, I can't imagine um, the frustration and the, just the anguish and everything that goes along with it because it affects so much of your life. Right. I yeah. mean, it just, it's every aspect of your life. It affects your relationship with everybody. Um, and then you're trying to focus on just becoming a, a version of the person you were before. And I, I just, man, that is got to be so tough mentally to, to strive and reach to, you know, it was difficult, but what I, you know, like I said before too, though, you know, I mean, I had so many people reaching out and checking in, supporting, you know, moral support, whatever. And, uh, you know, it's big difference, you know, so I always look back and was like, you know, I'm really pretty lucky because, you know, there's plenty of people in this world that aren't in, uh, the people don't know they're not, you know, uh, they don't have fans or whatever, you know, they have small families and, uh, and there are a lot of people, they're just on it sort of on their own to get over, could be a car accident going down the street or falling off, of, uh, off a porch or whatever, you know, there's plenty of like major um, things that happen to people, but they're not, they're not well supported. You know, they don't have a lot of like, you know, that sort of support like I did. So that definitely 
it wasn't fun. That's for sure. It was definitely, you know, uh, uh, you know, it was not a good time, but it was definitely, I was always thinking how lucky I was that I had people reaching out all the time. Yeah. And that, that appreciation for others and, you know, all that I, I, yeah, no, I, I get that. Yeah. And I would do steps, you know, like, I mean, there's so much, like, I mean, it was big time, uh, still am, but big time into sailboat racing. And so, you know, my sailboat was at the Harbor Clipper Yacht Harbor down in Sausalito. And I could, I had to be driven down to the, to the Harbor. And then I could just sort of walk down the dock, but I couldn't walk up the two steps, the ladder, not even a ladder. It's like a, a little stepway. I couldn't walk up to get onto my boat. So there was like seven or eight times, the first seven or eight times I went back down there, I could just walk down the dock and I could just look at my boat and I couldn't even get out and sail it. And that was the same way in my garage. I mean, I had my go-kart there and I, I looked at it or I had my mountain bike, but I couldn't even, you know, I couldn't even get on, I couldn't even come near to doing any of that stuff, you know? So um, it was, uh, you know, actually having all those things uh, were, was definitely motivation too, because I wanted to get back and do all that stuff. So it was nice to, nice to have that as well. What right. was your first time in a race car after that? Well, my first time was, um, so the time, actually the team I'm racing for now, the sponsor I'm racing for now, which is TKO Motorsports, they, uh, the owner of TKO Motorsports, um, his lead um, uh, engineer that works with him up there at their facility, he was a guy that I knew from go-karts that you should actually build, uh, weld up my frames at Track Magic. And anyway, uh, his boss, Dave, who's from TKO, wanted to get into go-karts. And so Marty was like, I know the guy. And so uh, Dave called me up and said, I want to race go-karts. And I was like, I think like two and a half years off the accident. So I hadn't been cleared to drive yet. So he came down and he bought a go-kart. Well, first we rented a go-kart, then he bought a go-kart. And then we started go-karting and uh, he started go-karting. And then we became good friends. Um, and after I was healed, uh, cleared to drive three, three years later, started driving go-karts. He said, okay, Mames, he said, uh, uh, I'm buying this car right here. And it was a GT3R Porsche and uh, I want you to drive it. So uh, the first car that I got back into was, um, was uh, TKO Motorsports, their GT3R Porsche uh, around Sonoma. And uh, man, it felt so good. Oh, I bet. <laughs> so unbelievably good but that was the that was the first car i was in was uh in, which is also the same sponsor that i'm with now which is awesome you know so. what um so what what's here so you so you're racing um so you're racing this year at all or yeah so now i'm racing um uh sro the sro series which i uh, always to people I always tell them hey it's the old pirelli world challenge series oh okay yeah <laughs> Oh yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> they're like SRO. What's that? So it's Pirelli World Challenges was bought by SRO, who's another uh, European driver that's put together a series. And so it's the SRO series. And so um, this all just came together a couple months ago. But um, TKO Motorsports bought um, the Gently, the Bentley GT3 from Kpax um, GT3 car, and then uh, I just had our first two races in it at Road America a few weeks ago. And we're going to do, um, I leave for Sebring in a week. There's an SRO race at Sebring, um, double header, and then also Indy, Indy Road Course. Oh. And the SRO series, I mean, they're a lot of cars. Like they have, you know, the GT4 race they just had, there was 40 cars that were in it. You know, GT3 cars, there's, you know, 20 something cars. So it's a, it's a great GT series, pro series, GT series that runs. And then the idea is to do the races this year in the Bentley um with tko and then tko wants to also maybe do the full season next year so they sort of partnered with flying lizard who's always run porsches um and they're running the car so they're based in sonoma flying lizard but it's the tko motorsports uh bentley um that uh that will run probably next year as well Scott, you want to um, ask your question? Sure. That you usually get to. Sure, and this one's going to be kind of interesting because I mean, you have zero 
racing background. So um, I ask a question. I always try to, to give uh, who we're speaking with a chance to talk about a person or persons who was most instrumental in their career or someone who did something for them uh, that you that really kind of helped them at a critical time. And, and just from listening to this interview, I mean, this, this sounds like just the entire step of the way it was just person after person, but is there a couple people you can identify out of that? Well, it's, you know, they're not in racing. I mean, it's definitely like my mom and dad. Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> I mean, sure. my mom, you know, great. She's just such an awesome individual. My dad, I mean, he was, you know, for me to race dirt bikes, I mean, we were very, very, very low income, you know, he was a pipe fitter. And so he would race, he would um, work graveyard shift. And then he would come, my parents were divorced at the time. He'd come pick me up, you know, after working all night long. And then we'd go out and I'd get to race my dirt bike. So, um, you know, those two and my mom, you know, currently my dad, you know, he was born in 1913. So he's not around, he's been wow. like 20 something years. Um, but my mom was 25 years younger than my dad and my mom and I, you know, the last 20 years, I mean, she, we do everything together. You know, she, she races on my sailboat. She's one of my crew, you know, she does, uh, you know, she's, she's just, uh, it's an inspiration is to have, um, both of them are basically why I am who I am today, you know? So a lot of great opportunities in racing The list just goes on and on from the people that helped. Um, but it all started with, with my parents for sure. You know, I, and Aaron knows what I'm getting ready to say here. And anybody that listens to the show knows what I'm going to say. Um, I mean, the fathers, the fathers oftentimes are, you know, kind of the idol of the, of the child or whatever. Um, you know, cause a lot of times they, you know, they, the kid grows up and the dad has been into cars or racing or whatever. But I, I say this over and over again, and I just recently lost my mom. And this holds true for my mom as well as the mothers in the sport of auto racing drive the sport. Um, I, I, you know, I feel like over and over again, we, and we've heard these stories several times on the show where the mothers, you know, are the ones who just are kind of that dry, you know, they, they offer that backbone um, that's just really needed to, to succeed in this sport and, and succeed at anything I'm sure, but. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, parents, both parents in general, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, I was fortunate to have, you know, parents that, you know, did what they wanted to do, you know, like, uh, they weren't locked into, you know, they did what was enjoyable to them. And, um, you know, they, uh, they worked hard for sure. I mean, um, uh, both of them are older, but my dad was, you know, he was, you know, he was back in the days of the Great Depression. I mean, his one of his parents died, died of the flu epidemic, you know, during the 1920s. Right. So, um, you know, they both of them came from those, those different, you know, I mean, where the worlds we live in now, I mean, it's just, you know, it's like Disneyland everywhere. Anybody that's complaining about how the world is, is crazy. So it's like having, you know, having parents that are older that, that, uh, you know, are such great people and work hard. And then just for me, they just let me do, um, whatever I wanted to do. Basically it gave me some advice, but, um, you know, just let me do what I wanted to do and supported me and just were, were there, you know, um, you know, just enjoying it with me. So that was nice. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's the best case scenario, right? I mean, that's, if they can enjoy the, you know, the time doing it as well. And, and that's, that, that, that's just great. You know, I feel. Yeah, for sure. Kind of another question he usually asks, but I feel like I probably already know the answer. Best he usually asks what what the best racing story is, but I have a feeling it probably is something from the year you drove for Playboy. <laughs> you mean the best off track experience? Uh, it can be on track, be on track. You know, everybody in the paddock's got a story, like their their group of stories they love to tell, and. Uh, you know, any racer, any racer does. And, uh, I always try to try to find out what their best racing story is. You know, it could be anything. Um, uh, Willie T ribs was, uh, you know, was, what was his, was it hanging out with Mike Tyson or something like that? Oh yeah. Uh, Mike Tyson. Yeah. Stuff like that. But there's so many, I mean, we could do an entire show hours long on just rental car experiences. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
but there, I mean, it's just, there's, there's so many, I, I think, um, you know, from a racing standpoint, it was, uh, you know, winning the super nationals on a track magic go-kart when there was myself down there for the team. And there was one other customer there. And after that race, then the, then the uh, carts were back ordered for a year and a half. So oh, yeah, wow. doing stuff like that, you know, being for me, there's just been so many opportunities, so many instances where I've been sort of the unknown guy and just come in and just people are like, where did this all come from? So, um, that's all really good. And then, um, you know, yeah, I mean, racing for Playboy, I mean, <laughs> that was awesome. Or just, you know, just all the people that I meet or continue to meet in racing, but met a lot of new people back kind of coming up through the ranks, you know, they're awesome. You know, they're just so great, you know, um, and just the cars, you know, the Indy cars, the champ cars, so unbelievably fast. And, and, uh, it's just, I don't know. There's, <laughs> I don't know. Lots of, lots of good experiences. That's for sure. Do you, um, you know, and, and you, you kind of, like we alluded to earlier, man, you were, you were the super sub, right? Uh, for so much of your career, uh, were you just really good at managing your money, uh, to make it last? Cause you knew that, you know, you didn't have these long-term contracts. How, how have you been able to, truly support yourself through the years is did you take that money and invest it yeah right well for instance um you know when i lived out in uh when i was racing indy cars i lived out in uh indiana and uh and i lived on a i lived rent free in a, a friend of my manager's his house i lived rent free in his in one of his rooms in his house so um i just you know just managed to just get by with very little money and um uh you know that's all of the, all of them a career was like that and then yeah there were years like um racing for ganassi a little bit um but racing for whether it was the other indycar guys too or racing for daytona prototypes a few years doing full-time rides there you know whether it was with um uh finley motorsports or um, you know, Doran racing, who I raced for, I was able to make a little bit of money. And then, uh, lucky for me, the housing crunch, the housing bubble burst. And then, uh, I bought a few houses then, which was good. It didn't take much money, you know? And so, um, that's nice because now at least I get, um, rental checks that come in, which is good. So I can continue to, I've always been lucky because I can lucky or at least been in situations where I continue to do exactly what I want to do. I mean, when I was racing, getting paid to race track magic go-karts, I think I made $800 a month or something like that. And so I paid my $400 a month rent or whatever it was. And I lived off $400, you know, or whatever it was. At that wow. time. So it wasn't like I was, I was just always frugally living, but, um, and then, but still even now it's like, you know, I want to race cars. Um, but when I'm not racing cars, I don't have to get like, uh, I always say I don't have to get a real job, <laughs> but right. you know, I do sailing stuff. I have a sailing business, charter business where I take people out. I'm a commercial captain's license. So I operate other people's vessels. So I haven't chartered for about a month because I've just been busy with racing stuff. So when the racing stuff gets busier than the other stuff gets, I have to make it slow down a little bit, or if the racing slows down, then the coaching gets busier and you know, it's just, just been able to sort of balance all that. And then also, uh, also nice to have a, a wife that actually earns good money too. So <laughs> right. a professional, she earns money. So that's nice too. So, um, you know, uh, it's just, uh, uh, you know, nice to be able to just sort of continue with what I love doing. Um, you know, I just think that, you know, and I tell my daughter, I have a 17 year old daughter and I have a six month year old daughter and uh, wow I can't tell That's my spread mother. yeah i can't tell the six month old much but the 17 year old i say hey listen you know get out there and do what you really love doing i go if you want to be a garbage if you love garbage go be a garbage person and then eventually you're going to own a garbage company and you're going to you know love doing what you're doing and and be love it so much you'll be successful at it you know don't get sidetracked where you feel like you have to earn money you have to take a job so that you can earn money. I go, that is just so not what I believe in. Go do something you really love or that you you like a lot, you know, 
and you'll be successful at it because it, it shows in the work ethic that you put into it. So, um, so I've just, been yeah, I think that's great advice. And, and, um, you know, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm a nine to fiver now after spending years owning my own business. And, uh, and it's, it's a definitely, um, it's definitely a, a different world than, you know, owning your own business and doing all that. Uh, but I think that's great advice because you, you never want to instill fear, especially in the young people, because that's the beauty of life. We do this once you, yeah. you want to be able to experience it. And, uh, and there's so many opportunities today, especially for younger people, uh, through things like, you know, YouTube or, or just, you know, there's so many different alternative ways of making money and, and that sort of thing. And, and as long as you're not locked into this kind of mindset of, I, you know, I got to do this to do this to do this, uh, when you're younger, if, if you are freer, I, I think that's the best way to do it because you can find your opportunities, you know, and um, at least that's my personal philosophy. Well, that's where, like I said, I mean, when you look at successful businesses and successful pe people, you know, um, the reason they're successful is because they have a passion for it. I mean, you right. know, somebody that's got a successful company and they hate being there, you know, like it just doesn't, you know, they might have employees that hate being there, but but they have a passion to be there themselves. Otherwise, it wouldn't be successful. So, absolutely, that's a good way. I think. Yeah, wow. absolutely. Well, um, you have anything else, Scott? I don't, man. This has been an absolute pleasure. You know, you're a guy I didn't know much about, and, and I, I think back to what you said earlier about somebody writing into Robin Miller, and and it's just so funny how people prejudge uh, others and, and without even knowing their background. Yeah. And there, there's something about honor racing that in America, that there is always this preconception that if this guy has kind of a different name or, you know, a lot of people think Joseph Newgarden is foreign, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <he's> <laughs> from Tennessee. and, uh, and, and they think that these, that you, you know, these drivers all have this, big money and all that. And it, and, and several people we've interviewed on this show are the same way. They didn't come from a big money background that they had to work at it and they had to make alliances and they had to, to, you know, just go through it. And, um, I, and I think that's, that was one of the nice things to hear. Cause I didn't know much about your story. Uh, again, just that perseverance and that hard work. Yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, it's just what makes it happen, you know? I mean, it's just how I was raised. And, you know, I think it's also, it's just got me, you know, connection to so many fans uh, coming up through when I was got it, was racing Indy cars or coming up through. People were had a huge fan following because I was just like, you know, the average guy that was just out there, you know, doing what I love doing. And, uh, you know, you know, I just had an average background of no racing. And so it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it worked out really well for me from that side, that standpoint too, you know? Yeah, it was, it was an absolute pleasure hearing your story. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank no, th thanks so much for coming on. And uh, I'll definitely have to try to go to the track and watch you race. It's a race in October, right? Yeah, we've got two of them. We've got, uh, I think the first weekend, October, like the second and third mm -hmm. uh, is down at Sebring. So like a week from this weekend is at Sebring. And then two weeks after that is Indy. Right. So, um, yeah, because you're that's where you're at is Indy. I'm, I can see the pagoda from my front yard. So, well, if you don't come, I'm going to be severely uh, uh, insulted. So, you almost have to come. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely, um, I, as long as I'm not doing anything, I will be there. Plus, you get to see a Bentley GT3 twin turbo V8 Bentley like ground pounding out there against these small little nimble cars, you know? So right, uh, absolutely. it's awesome to see. And uh, it's a great weekend. It'll be busy, you know, a lot of cars, a lot of racing, you know? So not only you, but anybody that's out there, come on out and check it out. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks again, Mimo. All yeah, right, Scott, thanks, Aaron. Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Also, Aaron, thanks you. Appreciate it. Take, take care, bud. Okay, see you guys.